Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Jamie, for that introduction. Um, so yes, the, I would I do want to highlight the two years fellowship with um, Dr. Andrew Weil, which kind of um, by default I found found this through my teaching at Truman Medical Center in the ECT program. It was an anesthesiologist that looked at me one day. Have you looked at integrative medicine? <laughs> Um, so there we got the opportunity to learn um, from Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, energy medicine, and what is appropriate and not appropriate to use in um, Western medicine, and um, does it have legitimate data behind it. Um, and so then I went to found Dr. Troni Lodog that way, she was the medical director. And so that's how I ended up doing the herbal foundations course, because Herbals fascinated me. I come from a background of agriculture, grew up in a very small town and was in Future Farmers of America. So there's a little tidbit about me that most people don't know. Um, so I listed the, the slides and uh, the herbs in alphabetical order pretty much just so for ease. Just And I did a little bit difference. I've put some of the references to the end of each herb. So that way people, when you looked it up, if you wanted the slide presentation, you could look it up a little easier um, than just putting all the references at the end and then trying to sort through which ones for what. Um, so this is by no means comprehensive because uh, like I said, it was an 18 month herbal course. And that wasn't uh, even completely comprehensive because there's tons and tons of herbals. So the goals of this presentation is not to make you herbalist. It's just to kind of get you more comfortable asking patients about supplements and herbals that they may be taking. Most of them are very hesitant because they're afraid their physicians are going to tell them not to take them. Um, it's also recognizing that there are therapeutic values in herbs that we can kind of use to augment our medications and how we can do it appropriately and safely without um, kind of uh, just saying, just stop that, but recognizing they're taking it and adjusting our meds and or telling them how to adjust their medication if, the, if it even needs adjusted. Uh, most are underdosing, so most of them do not need under um, adjusted. Um, and to review how herbals are being used in the population as a whole right now, a little bit, I will tell you each herb, um, how they're kind of snuck into um, the patient's supplements or they're maybe taking it without realizing it. So um, here's a kind of little overview of the pictures of these. Um, you may recognize some of these do grow wild um, uh, um, throughout different areas of the population. Um, the only one that most of us may not recognize unless you're in the tundra area is rhodiola. Um, it only goes under the, the tundra. So the first herb is ashwagandha. Um, ashwagandha is also known as Indian ginseng. Um, I will not say all the Latin names because I always get tongue-tied. Um, this one is in herbal medicine, we use different terms. Um, things like adaptogen means that they kind of are used to kind of help regulate or balance things. So they have more than one component. The thing about herbs are there's no way to, um, to really copyright them. So, cause they're natural. And so there's no way to separate out all of the compounds and figure out which one works for what. So for instance, I want to remind you that medicine in general all has developed from herbs. Digoxin came from foxglove, aspirin from willow bark. So all of these came through after they were able to isolate compounds and make them and use them as therapeutic values. So the adaptogen, they don't really know all of the compounds, but they know that there's compounds that affect different aspects of the, the body. So it's typically used as an immune modulator, a nervine or a relaxant is a secondary. I put the dosages in here as a guide and reference for most studies are done saying that these medications or herbals don't work, but they're under dosing them um, or overdosing them. So they're not using what the therapeutic values are that the most herbalists would use. They, most herbalists have what they call a materia medica, 
And that is kind of like a PDR for herbs. Um, it, the Compendium E in German, Germany is the go-to herbal reference. If you ever want um, exact references for herbals, they're very strict. And it's almost like the FDA regulations of herbals. Um, so this is a crude extract, um, one to six grams. So crude is just the herb itself. So you're not gonna be as potent, so you'll need higher doses. The extracts are typically alcohol extracts or glycerides. So those are extracted, and so you only need about 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams a day. And then the withanolides are the active component that we're aware of, the two to 5% of withanolides is typically what you want for the ashwagandha. So um, it does have, um, so it's used because it has some high iron content. So they often use it for anemia and Ayurvedic medicine. There um, is some caution with this herb because it can stimulate thyroid activity. Um, it has caused hyperthyroid in some patients. So if you are, if someone comes in a little anxious and they've been taking some, some weight loss medication over the counter or some, um, it's also found in some performance things for people who are weightlifting and or exercising. So you have to kind of watch that. They're using it as a decreased stress response because it does blunt the CRH hormone. So it does lower stress and lowers anxiety, but they're advertising it that would help lose belly fat. That's what they're implying. They can't say it does help lose belly fat, but that's what they're implying with these and adding them to supplements. So it can interfere with digoxin level assays. It doesn't interfere with digoxin level itself, but it can give a false positive in one of the assays and a false negative uh, low dose in one of the assays. So you have to be aware if these patients are taking um, digoxin and they're taking some supplements trying to lose weight and ashwagandha or the withenia somnifera is in it that their assays may be off. Um, so it is metabolized by the CYP3A4 enzymes. It is not inhibitory in nature. So there's very little drug-drug interactions. It's not recommended in pregnancy. However, it's not well studied, like most herbals, it's not well studied and it's been used in pregnancy, but we don't recommend them just because we don't know. Um, so some of the references here, I do use a lot of NIH has some really good published data on herbal medications and for um, education on complementary medicine, science direct, but also nature has some really good information regarding um, some of the natural studies. So the next one here is Bacopa. Um, Bacopa is one of my favorites because it's um, an ADHD medication. A lot of people will know about this and a lot of kids, they do use this in kids. Um, it's primarily an anxiolytic and it's also used as a memory enhancer and adaptogen. So these are the, the, um, the dosages that are mainly used. 10 to 20% um, bacocides is what you want for it to be able to be uh, therapeutic. So it's also known as the Ayurvedic herb Brahmi. Um, so it's been documented since 800 BC, been used for depression and psychosis and epilepsy. I don't know any data um, for psychosis and epilepsy, but for insomnia and depression, it does have some data behind it. Um, it does work on acetylcholine, serotonin and GABA. Um, there are studies showing that um, it's as effective as lorazepam without motor deficits in rats. So um, it does help. And it also shows some improved learning in healthy children with ADHD. And this is where um, you're going to see a lot of um, people in the with diagnosis of autism that are looking for more natural ways of helping with autism and ADHD. Um, you'll come across Bacopa. So just to give you an idea of that, and it can increase Tegretol levels. So that is a population that may be on Tegretol too for mood stabilization. So that is something to be aware of that they are using this. Um, 
without us knowing, and they're very close knit about it. But if you start talking about herbals, they often open up about them. So the neuroprotective comes from mainly the acetyl cholinesterase inhibition and the cholinacetyl transferase activation. It has some beta amyloid reduction and modulation of acetylcholine. And so it does work on serotonin and dopamine. It does have non-competitive inhibition of CYP2C19 and 9, and then the um, 1A enzyme. So it is something that it could inhibit and have some drug interactions. It's really just not very strong in the inhibition. California poppy. This is one of my favorites just because I like it. It's nice and bright and usually yellow or orange. It's not the red poppy that everybody knows and uses for other things. This is non-addictive. It's a nerving um, relaxant and used for anxiety and sleep aid and antispasmodics. Because it has the antispasmodics, it does also have some pain properties to it. Without being addictive, there is population that is using this for um, pain and opioids, especially for withdrawal because it's antispasmodic. So people can use this, especially if they are struggling, like the post-acute withdrawal syndrome that our patients talk about that are anxious and wanting something to kind of calm them down and stuff that works very lovely. What's really nice about California poppy, uh, I do, one of my best friends growing up is an, a botanist and works with flowers, all wildflowers and stuff all day long. And um, actually you can eat the flower. It's very peppery in flavor. So they oftentimes will add it to salads. Um, it does work on the GABA receptors. It's non-habit forming. Um, it has acetylcholinesterase cholinesterase inhibitor activity. And so it does have a serotonin blockade at 5-HTP1A. Um, so it does have some, um, the alcohol extract showed dependent CYP3A4 in 2C9 and 2C19 inhibition and reversal at 2D6. Um, you have to realize though, it's an alcohol extract. So it's going to have, the alcohol has a component there too. So there's no way to separate out the alcohol versus the, the actual drug. And this is an alcohol extract primarily. Um, chamomile, which is probably one of the most common known um, herbs that we're all like, it's in every grocery store in this nation. I don't, every mom and pop grocery store has it. It's in your sleepy time tea. It's nerving relaxant. So what's interesting is we call it, it's a carminative mild bitter. So one of the things to recognize about this carminative means that it stimulates um, your digestive enzymes. And so it also stimulates bile uh, release from your gallbladder. So if someone has stones in their gallbladder, it may upset their stomach. So that's something to be aware of, but it's also an antispasmodic. It actually has some relaxation in the esophageal sphincter area. So you should never drink this except for maybe two, an hour to two hours before bed and because it's going to release that and you may have some reflux. So um, that's something that most people don't realize about. It's in sleepy time tea, but if you lay down right after you drink it, you can get reflux. Um, so two to three times a day, it does have some data in generalized anxiety disorder. Um, in the 70s, it was verified as healing for the stomach lining. And it's also been shown to help with colicky babies. So anytime we can help mommies with colicky babies, that lowers stress, right? Um, so um, typically you can just take the tea, hopefully not hot, and rub it on either the nipple before breastfeeding or rub it on the nipple of the 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 bottle and it typically helps soothe their stomachs and help them to be less colicky. It was combined with some other herbs to do that, but just chamomile in general will help with that. Um, so GABA, it does in vitro work on the GABA receptors and it does cross the blood brain th barrier. Um, and it does stimulate tyrosine, increasing the monoamine. monoamine. So be aware that, you know, the, this is not very potent 
So we're not looking at the elevated blood pressure and stuff like that and the interactions that you would see in MAOIs, but it does work in those areas. Um, we do have to watch it with um, sedatives in general, but anti-epileptics and anticoagulants because of the P450 enzyme. So when I was talking about the dosages earlier, um, one of the things I've seen a study about chamomile um, that is very disturbing because it says that it causes birth defects. Um, the study was done on a super extract. The super extract was, which is essentially like essential oil, um, is a, a super extract. Um, the super extract was so potent that it was equivalent to 16 cups of chamomile a day. Um, not many people can drink 16 cups of chamomile a day. That would be very difficult, even for an herbalist who drinks it on a regular basis. Everybody's eyeballs popped out of their heads whenever we read that study. Um, so, and by the way, I, part of my herbal foundations course is we have an active group going on on Facebook that we talk on a regular basis to ask questions on. So we do review studies every now and then too. Um, so that's chamomile and it's everywhere. So the next one everybody loves, not always, but most people associate it with beer is hops. Um, but hops is definitely a sedative. It's also a bitter and carminative. It's very, very bitter. Uh, by the way, in flavor. So most people are not going to drink it as a tea because it's bitter enough. You have to choke it down. Um, put a little honey in it. Um, it might, it at least takes a little bit better, but it's antispasmodic. It's phytoestrogen and, and, and has some antimicrobial points, but the phytoestrogen component is very important to know because um, they actually, in it's on the next slide here, um, there were some women that were picking hop fields and they were having menstrual irregularities and they couldn't figure out what was going on. That's how we found out about the phytoestrogens in hops. So now it's required um, in commercials, if they pick it by hand, that they wear gloves and that um, regulated their irregularities because it does have potent phytoestrogen components. It's been used all over the world for sleep. Typically it's um, combined with... Um, valerian here in the United States, um, and it's as effective as benzodiazepines for improving sleep, time to fall asleep, and there's no rebound insomnia. So this has been used on the market for a long time, um, and then, then pharmaceuticals have taken their place. So it is something that we can kind of gear people to if they're having difficulties with sleep. Um, a few years back, there was um, some news that Walmart's um, herbal supplements and stuff were not as potent as they said they were. Um, there's some difficulties with that study because some of them were processed and there is going to be natural denaturalization of the proteins that they tested for. So it, the study wasn't completely accurate, but it, and they're effective. They're just sometimes not as quite as potent. Typically I, I gear patients if they're gonna buy herbals or supplements to go to a specific nutrition-based store if they're really that hardcore about wanting something that works to get more pharmaceutical grade. Um, it does work on the GABA receptors and inhibits the CYP2C18, I mean, sorry, eight, C9 and C19 and then CYP1A2. Um, so it does have some interference with some things. Here's another very, very common drug. I think most of us know about lavender. Um, this can also be used um, in culinary wise. Um, I, I really like lavender chocolate um, and it can be used in other foods. Um, even some, they got some lavender, lavender cocktails nowadays. Nervine, it's a primary effect. It's for anxiety. Um, it's also a carminative, antispasmodic and antimicrobial. When combined with some other, um, as a, a aromatherapy, it does help when I say antimicrobial, it can decrease some of the, um, the microbes in the air around us and help fight off some infections. They've shown that. Um, a side note is that the essential oils are very, very 
strong and it's not recommended to use essential oils directly on the skin without being in a carrier oil um, mainly because some of them can burn the skin um, i'm not too thrilled about some of the essential oil companies that promote people put a couple drops in their drinks and stuff unless they're food grade but there's always someone that's going to put more than what they say to put in there um, i've ran across this with a with a nurse once that was taking lemon drops and she's like it called for two to three and she was putting like five and then she was wondering why she had cystitis. Um, so um, it, it really is something in France, you have to have a prescription for essential oils. So you have to be trained in them. You have to have a prescription for them. So they are potent. So do not minimize those essential oils when people come in because they do have effects. Um, Lavender is actually one you can use um, topically straight out. It actually prevents burns from um, turning into blisters if you get it on there quick enough. We always have it in our kitchens. Um, so it does have MAOA um, activity, CERT inhibition, GABA-A, and it works on NMD receptor modulation. So there's no significant drug-drug interactions that have been noted with lavender. Um, it's been used for centuries. Now, this is one of my favorites. Um, it saved me on multiple things. As Jamie said, I was a uh, medical director of a 28 bed inpatient unit um, and it was a community behavioral health agency. Um, and then I went and practiced in a rural area and we had a small um, unit, 10 beds. And, you know, we didn't have the luxury of security um, in a small rural setting. And so when you got violent patients, they were really hard to, um, manage sometimes. However, I put herbals on the unit for teas and I taught my nurses how to use them. And so the patients loved this, this one, because I chose it because of lack of drug, drug interactions. It's very tolerable. It tastes like tea with a slight lemon flavor. Um, it works very good for anxiety. Um, the trick with teas is that you have to let them steep for seven minutes. I always tell my patients 10 minutes because I know they're not going to wait the full 10 minutes. Um, it's seven is what, the, what you have to do. It will not be potent enough unless you wait seven minutes. Um, and so most of us just dip it until it looks like it's dark enough and that's not going to be therapeutic at all. Um, this one particular here, um, it's endorsed by the European Scientific Cooperative Phytotherapy um, for tenseless irritability and symptomatic treatment of digestive disorders and herpes labellus. Um, this is found in some of those um, over-the-counter um, cold sores remedies. Um, that's what's found in that. And besides licorice root, it's also known as a gladdening herb. So part of why I love this herb is when we were educated about this herb, we had had dinner the night before and the families were all allowed to come. And she used my child as the example of who you would give this to. Um, so it does have some acetylcholinesterase inhibition, but it also has this anxiolytic so it works very lovely for your kind of hyperactive toddler that just needs to calm down. Doesn't really, you don't want them to sedate them or anything. You just want them to take that little irritable edge off. Um, and it works lovely for mom too, but it also works for the colicky babies. Um, this one is easy to grow. Like for, if someone wants a cheap, effective way to grow this, it's in the mint family. In the Midwest, you plant it in your yard, it'll take it over and you can smell minty lemon flavor everywhere. It also cuts down on um, uh, mosquitoes. So it works on the GABA T inhibition and reduces level of cortisterone. It's um, very limited information on metabolism, but there's no drug drug interactions known. So it's a very effective one to keep in your stock for people that, and it's very easy, very cheap to have. And most, at least most Walmarts around here, their little um, greenhouse area typically has lemon balm in it. So it is something that is easily obtainable for most people.
And it, it also can be made overnight. Like you put some in your uh, pitcher overnight and then you can have your cold tea throughout the morning. So it's also a really great one that people can, they kind of have anxiety, they want to take it, but they don't want to have um, any, you know, motor impairment throughout the day or be sleepy throughout the day. I talk to them about carrying a thermos of this and kind of sipping on it throughout the day or drinking it throughout the day kind of helps them out. So this one here, one of the formulations I used to use was traditional medicinals. Uh, it was a linden flower, lemon balm, hawthorn mix. And um, so this is why linden flower is in here. Um, at the time, what I was unaware of is the cardiac effects of linden flower if you use it too much. But um, it was very effective. And I used to call it Ativan in a cup. Um, literally, I had that tea. It was a day after I had to take someone to negotiate someone to the ER with there was five cops following me as he had a knife. <clears throat> and so I was kind of wound up the next day and I was like, okay, I should try this finally. And so I tried it and I literally felt like I'd taken a benzo, but I did not have the, the motor impairment. So, but it also works as peripheral benzodiazepine receptors is where it works. So it does very much help augment if you're wanting someone a little bit more potent for anxiety, but it does have diuretic effects. So it can increase lithium. So it's something to kind of be aware of. And there are some reported allergic reactions. Any plant based herbal that has the typical plant tops, so even chamomile have allergic reactions with them. If they're root based, there's less chances of allergic reactions. So a tidbit back to chamomile is that it has an interaction. If someone's allergic to um, ragweed, it is in the ragweed family. So there is a potential for them to have a, a allergic reaction. There's been two case studies reported, but, um, and I know of one person in my life that has had that allergy cross reaction. So the next one is maca. So maca is actually in a lot of energy drinks. It's going to be in a lot of your teas. It's in a ton of things. I've been paying attention to reading labels on these nutritional things, and it's there. It's known as an aphrodisiac because um, it increases nitrogen oxide um, in, your, in your blood vessels. So it does decrease acetylcholinesterase and helps with concentration, but it is something to be aware of that people are taking. Anything that kind of stimulates energy obviously can also impair sleep. And when you impair sleep, you have potential of hypomania or mania in our bipolar patients. So I typically um, watch those type of things when they're saying they're having they're drinking something that I know has a lot of maca in it or some sort of stimulant of some sort, then I watch for that. Passion flower. This is also one of my favorite ones. Um, so most of them think it's just this pretty unique flower. It's a nervine relaxant. Um, I will tell you, I did, um, before I tell you about the, uh, I did have a patient who had, um, she was, ovarian cancer, stage four ovarian cancer. She had gone into remission and she was in her, she had had a recurrence and was came to me with lots and lots of anxiety after her last dose of chemotherapy. So she wanted something more natural um, instead of all these medications. Someone had already put her on Zoloft, someone had already put her on Ativan, someone had already put her on Trazodone and it was just not working for her. Um, one of the things we kind of forget is our medications does increase the risk of some of the female cancers. So um, benzodiazepines do have a small increased risk of increasing ovarian cancer. And so does some of the SSRIs because of the estrogen effect of serotonin. So I put her on passion flower and she did fabulous with it. And she only did the teas. Um, so it does have um, some monoamine oxidase inhibition, so it can help with depression. Um, 45 drops a day of diazepam, uh, of, I'm sorry, of passion flower extract was equivalent to diazepam without having the motor effects 
um, for lowering anxiety. So 45 drops is approximately about two droppers full. Most um, tinctures, if you buy them, have um, a little dropper in it and it's about 20, 21 drops in a dropper. Um, so people are using this for withdrawals. Um, I did a data search because one of my patients told me about this once. And so they are using um, passion flower for opiate withdrawal and nicotine withdrawal to help with cravings. Um, there's no data on this. It's just, it's out there. If you look and you Google it, there's patients and people saying this all over the place. There is one report of QT prolongation and non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. So you do have to be aware that um, it can cause some heart. They suspect there's just one report of it. So um, we don't know how many there are because a lot of people don't tell us that they're on these type of herbals. And the main interaction is with sedatives. Rhodiola, now this has a whole book written about it. Um, the interesting thing about rhodiola is most of the studies come from Russia behind the Iron Curtain. These, they've been using rhodiola for numerous things and this is found in the tundra. So when there's thawing that comes back, it's underneath the sheet of ice. Um, the, it's, they've been using it for Olympic athletes for a long time for perseverance, for them to perform longer and harder um, so it's got some anti-fatigue, it's um, fibromyalgia. You'll see people using it for their fibromyalgia. Um, it's got some antidepressant and anti-anxiety components. Uh, typically it, you'll see the extracts. There are the crude forms. I will tell you the crude forms take longer to work. They're not quite as absorbent and effective, but um, you'll see people taking them. Um, so it's also known as golden root. Um, it was included first in the Swedish pharmacopoeia in 1775. So it tells you how old this is. Um, and Linus mentioned Roliola in the Matrix Media in 1749 for depression and enhanced work performance. Fatigue and altitude sickness. It works lovely for altitude sickness for anybody who gets it. I get altitude sickness, you take it two weeks before and you don't have to worry about the headaches and the, the, the swelling of the face. Um, the, uh, it also, though, can impair sleep. So um, I personally love it for altitude sickness, but I have to take melatonin with it because it impairs my sleep, even if I take it in the morning. So the most studied compounds are rosin, residrin, and saladroside. It works for depression, anxiety, and chronic fatigue. Um, I've actually had someone with fibro that was trying to get off all of her medications. She did very well on this and we were able to get her Lyrica dosage way down to a more manageable le level where she wasn't so tired and fatigued all the time. Um, there's however, more than 140 compounds that have been isolated from rhodiola. So it's a lot to be studied yet in it. Um, it does decrease cortotropin releasing hormone and works through the HPA axis and modulates through there. So it also has effects on heat shock protein, c June, protein kinase and terminals and fork head boxo and transcriptive factor, fact, bleh, factor sorry. Um, so it's got multiple components to it. It works on nitric oxide there again, that helps with performance, beta endorphins, increases serotonin and dopamine. It can increase risk for serotonin syndrome in antidepressants like Paxil. And there has been one case report of it doing that. Um, otherwise, there's really no drug-drug interactions noted that they have found through the P450 enzymes. I did put a few clinical trial information here because they do use it overseas. Um, they do use rhodiola quite a bit for depression. Um, for This study is uh, mild to moderate and it was approved Everything, including um, individuals had overall depression, insomnia, emotional instability, somatization, but not self-esteem improvement um, over placebo in this study. And they studied 340 to 680 milligrams a day. Um, the 680, um, I've seen it as high as up to 700. There, you're looking at a little bit more potential to make someone anxious. 
Um, it's been shown to work for anxiety. However, some people get anxious on it, um, which is not any different than some of our SSRIs um, that make people anxious too sometimes. Um, I did use it in one patient who could not, he didn't tolerate, he was ADHD and he didn't tolerate um, the stimulants made him, he, he didn't like how it made him feel kind of disconnected. And I used the rhodiola and he did fabulous on it and never came back to see me. And I ran into him a year later and he was still taking it and thankful. Um, rosemary, some culinary herbs for you, especially since the holidays are coming up there, put some rosemary in your turkey there. Um, improved long-term memory with aromatherapy, um, improved speed of math computations, but not accuracy of math computations. Um, they did this study with some college students. It does inhibit um, acetylcholinesterase um, and butyl cholinesterase inhibition activity. Um, it does have an effect on serotonin and dopamine, but it needs a lot more research. It's not really, um, so don't be going out and buying the, um, everybody wants to buy the essential oil. Well, the essential oil works and it helps work with concentration. Um, like if you're in a room, like if you put it in your room and you want something kind of help you because you're kind of slow that day, rosemary will help with that. Um, and it also has been shown to decrease opioid withdrawal symptoms. Um, which was an interesting tidbit. Um, I'm not quite for sure how that works, but um, there were some studies showing that. And I put the enzymes down there um, again, and it does inhibit CYP3A4, which that means it could potentially interact with some of our medications. Saffron. Now this one is very impressive, but very expensive. Um, so, it's a nervine tonic relaxant. It's antidepressant, antispasmodic, diuretic, and lactulog. So lactulog means that it increases milk production. So your moms that are depressed that want something natural, there's a potential there um, that can increase production um, of milk. 50 to 100 milligrams BID stigma. And the stigma is that red component of the picture or 15 to 30 milligrams of the saffron petal. So you have to kind of separate those out. Um, the suggestion is cyclic AMP and the brain derived uh, nootrophic factor with nerve growth in the hippocampus area. The, there's some studies, head to head trials um, with if um, as effective as a mipramine I will tell you this, the side effects at the therapeutic dosage are equivalent to mipramine, constipation, dry mouth, some of the same symptoms. Like if you read the side effects, you're like, wow, that's similar <laughs> to a mipramine very much and its component. So who knows if some of it, it's similar to that way in theory. Um, so in percutaneous coronary intervention who had had depression, they were found to be as effective as pro uh, Prozac. Um, and so suggestive of dopamine, norepinephrine, and there's no drug interactions that we're aware of, but it is really expensive. Um, they have to harvest those little things and get the milligrams dosages, but adding saffron to your meals can really help too. Um, I'm big into nutrition. So saffron is used in like our meals and, um, can not hurt anything. So skullcap is another um, lovely herb. There's two different types. There's American and Chinese. The Chinese version is typically used for allergies and you'll see it as a supplement in um, the natural health food stores for allergies. The lateral flora is not the American and that's more for the nerving. And sometimes people can use them for anti-seizures. Um, some of them will use it for um, preventing seizures. Um, it's anti-inflammatory, anti-spasmodic. Um, and there's the information works on GABA A receptors, 5-HT7 receptors, and there's no data 
regarding P450 enzymes. I looked for hours trying to find any drug drug interactions with this one because I knew it probably had some and there's nothing there that I could find. St. John's board. This is the favorite of every medical test out there. I don't know why they pick on St. John's Fort, but they do. Maybe because it's the most well-known. I don't know. Um, it's typically known for its antidepressant effects, um, but really it's better for anxiety than it is for depression. Um, in the herbal world, they'll look at you and be like, okay, we use it for anxiety. In neuralgia, in um, anti-inflammatory, antiviral. So if you look at these dosages, one to three grams a day of crude extract, um, 900 to 1500 milligrams daily extract, what you're seeing at Walmart in the places our patients go buy them is 300 milligrams and they're taking it once a day, even though it says to take it three times a day. You do need to start low and titrate up just like we do with our SSRIs, but most people are not even taking a therapeutic dose that you even have to worry about because they're taking like 300 milligrams and that's it. Um, so I'll go into a little bit. Of, um, it's been used since Hippocrates times for treatment of mental disorders, menstrual disorders, nerve pain, stomach ulcers, topically for wounds and burns. It has a lidocaine like effect on um, topically. I have a St. John's wort plant that grows in one of our fence rows and I decided to harvest it and see if what they said was true. Um, when you pick one of those lovely flowers, your fingers will turn red um, and then they will go numb. Um, so it does work topically as um, kind of like lidocaine. Uh, and so that's how it's used for neuralgias is topically. Um, in Romans there times, some of the, the literature back then has soldiers who have had limbs amputated, taking it to forget the about the limb because they kept thinking the limb was still there. So um, they were taking it for essentially phantom limb pain. Um, it is superior to, to placebo for depression and it is a potent inducer of CYP3A4. That is always a board's test on just even internal medicine door boards, pediatric boards, they love asking that question, um, like it's the only herb out there that's used for depression. Um, so it is a serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine reuptake inhibition, um, and it can potentially cause serotonin syndrome. There has been very little data showing that it does, but it potentially can, and there is some case reports here and there about that. So it is a risk, though. I don't want to minimize that risk because it is potent if they're taking it at therapeutic doses. Valerian, typically mixed with hops, as I said earlier. Um, I don't even harvest valerian myself just because it looks so much like hemp weed around here. I'm afraid of not hemp weed, I mean um, hemlock, that I, I'm afraid I'll pick up hemlock instead of valerian. Um, it's a nerving relaxant. It's antispasmodic and carminative. So it's 1500 milligrams for sleep, 500 TID for anxiety and standardized extracts only are recommended. Anxiety and ner nervousness. It was on the Na United States national formulary as a sleep aid until the 1950s when the pharmaceutical sleep aids came out. So it mixed with hops is probably a little bit better than Ambien. Um, and the sleepwalking, there's no sleepwalking reported on hops and valerian. Um, it binds strongly to GABA-A receptors. Valerian is one of the um, herbs that it has to be taken regularly for it to effectively work. You have to take it up to two weeks for it to really have its benefit for the sleep. You can't just expect to take it one night in sleep. It has to be taken for two weeks and then you can get your um, works for sleep. 800 milligrams a day works for restless leg syndrome, um, but it's often combined in different formulations. Mainly with hops is where you're going to find it the most regularly in that for as a sleep aid for people with menopause. Um, so 5-HT5A receptor activity 
Vervain, this is another one that grows wild in um, good old Missouri. It's on my property all over. I love the purple vervain in the late summer. Um, it's also a relaxant, bitter, antispasmodic, and a mystical, which is interesting. Um, so Native Americans used to take this for prophetic dreams. Do not give it to someone that's having nightmares. Um, it will give you very vivid, very bright, vibrant dreams. Um, but it does work very well for sleep and anxiety. So if you have someone that is okay with having vivid dreams and doesn't have extreme nightmares, so your PTSD patients, I would kind of steer them away from vervain unless you do a lot of work with them prior to it. I always warn them and talk to them about um, their sleep and what we can do to help with that. Um, but it does have serotonin nora take reuptake inhibition similar to Paxil. So it does have some benefit there, but very little research, but it's out there. And especially if you work in the Native American population, you're going to see this used. Turmeric. I think everybody has heard of turmeric by now, hopefully. Um, it's been on every nutrition show, Dr. Oz, Dr. Who, all of them. Um, so turmeric is not a cure-all, but it's a potent anti-inflammatory. It's got tons of actions. Um, one of the things about turmeric is it's not very absorbable in the gut. It's actually um, in familial polyposis. It's been shown to can decrease um, polyps up to a third and decreasing their cancer risk because it sits in the gut. It has to be taken with pepperine or black pepper or some sort of fat in order to absorb it systemically. So it absorbs best with the pepper, the fat it absorbs, but just not as potent as the black pepper. Um, it does have COX-2 inhibition. So this is why it works for anti-inflammatory. We do know about the theories with depression and inflammation. Um, we know there's an overlap there. Um, so it does work for that. I did have a patient who was a gardener and was on back injections and I got her on turmeric with black pepper and within six months she was off the injections and out in her garden. Um, but she was taking about 1500 milligrams twice a day. I mean, 500 milligrams twice a day of the, she wouldn't take it three times a day, but she was taking it twice a day. And if it worked for her, it worked for me. Um, it does increase serotonin and dopamine transmission. It's an MAOA inhibition and inhibits liberation of glutamate similar to Prozac. So there is a head-to-head -head study with turmeric, 1500 milligrams a day, like 500, three times daily. And it was equivalent to Prozac 20 milligrams daily for antidepressant effect. Um, the great thing about turmeric is, um, and I joke about this, but it's kind of true, is um, people typically won't overdose on it because um, you're gonna have reflux prior to that. Um, it'll kind of, it's a spice. It will, you will have some reflux from it if you take it too large of dose. Um, it's decreased salivary cortisol levels in depressed patients, and there's potential drug-drug interactions. This is just a small picture of some of the things that um, turmeric does. Um, there's so many things if you really want to break it down. They don't know how to separate all of this. We do know that turmeric curcumin is the main active ingredient, but they know that there's other components at turmeric that help it act better. So the, the actual root works better and has some cohesiveness that is not just curcumin, but they're starting to market just curcumin because of it. And they are studying it in um, injecting it into some tumors and have found that it can lower, decrease tumor size. So it, this is an herb that you're going to hear more about along the way. Any questions? I know I talk fast too, but any questions? We did have one in the chat. Um, uh, <laughs> Dr. Bonner asked um, if lemon balm could be grown in, looks like zone 10B. Can you speak to that? 
Um, let me look up zone 10 B. Where's that at? You know, I looked it up when we were, when you were talking zone 10 B is, well, my zone 10 B is Miami, but there's also zone 10 B in California. And I think it can, but it would have to be in a shaded area. Um, it does not like too much sunshine and heat. So in her, you would be able to um, grow it like kind of like strawberries in the winter time there, um, but not in the summertime. So it's not a perennial. Um, just, areas. Right. Um, not, I, I don't think you'd be able to grow it in the summer. You can probably make it live like when it's 100 degrees out here, it'll grow. It's just that I have to water it more and I have to have it some shaded. Otherwise, it burns. Because there are certain things that, you know, some of these things like uh, rosemary and curcuma, uh, rosemary is kind of protective of insects. And it was interesting to me that the lemon balm keeps the mosquitoes away. Yeah. That being a problem around here. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's kind of has some of that... Uh, Oh, I forget the name of it. It's similar to citrulline, um, a C I T R I L L I N E yeah. effect. Um, so I'm not for sure if it does. It says any of the mints grow in 10B, so it should. I just oh. from experience in the summertime that it gets sunburnt somewhat. So you kind of have to have it in a shaded area. Well, Miami is very wet in the summer. It's like every, every five days out of seven, it rains. Yeah. Thank Any you. Questions, concerns? Yeah, we had another question from Dr. Samala Bai. She asked what company um, do you purchase your herbs from and where do you refer your patients to get them? So um, I don't buy from any specific companies um, per se. Um, I do go, so as a provider, you can actually go to Natural Partners or Emerson Ecologics and set up accounts. Um, those typically are pharmaceutical grade herbs um, there, meaning that they've gone through the USP process. What I educate patients are to look for the USP stamp because the USP is um, the essentially the FDA of USDA. So it means that they've been tested and screened and that they say that they have in it what it is. And then GMP is the other good practice, manufacturing practice is the other stamp to look for. And so I typically send them to look for those stamps. And I usually say, ask them, it depends on where they're at. I mean, so... If Walmart's all they have, Walmart's all they have. Um, there is a product that Walmart now carries called Solaray. It used in, um, I want to say, I don't want to get it confused because there's two different ones. There's Nature's Made and Made and something else that are really close that Walmart has branded. But it, it had Nature's Way, I believe. It was the actual company that got bought out and they are, they use, the regulations for the compendium E for their processing. And you can actually buy those through Walmart and even on walmart.com um, and have them shipped to the store. That's how you get around the shipping is to have them ship them to the store. Um, so you can kind of uh, look at those. Those That German company, there's, I, I've always get, I have to look it up each time. Nature's Way actually has like a purple cap for one and the green cap for the other ones for it's actually been clinically proven. And then the other one's just, um, it's not clinically proven, but has potential. But only herbalists really know the difference between those. I always have to look it up in my notes to figure out which one that is. All right, thank you. We had one more question from Julie Liu. Um, what is the amount of lemon balm leaves to water ratio that you would use for effect, to be effective in tea? Um, so typically um, a tablespoon of dried herb is enough for a one, like an eight ounce cup of tea. Um, and then like fresh, um, it's kind of hard with fresh because um, you can just, I just usually grab about a cup of fresh and chop it up and put it in um, 
a pitcher of tea because um, it really absorbs overnight and it's strong enough. We're just about at time. Does anyone have any last questions? This was excellent. Thank you, Dr. Farmeyer. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Farmeyer, and thank you for everyone for joining us. We will send out a recording. Um, and if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to reach out. Please go. All right. Have a good thank evening, everyone. Bye-bye. So have a great night.